Good evening, everybody. Great to see you. Thanks for being with us. And um, we're going to have a good night tonight. Before we get started, our friend Jeff Querfeld is here for missions. Jeff's going to share a quick announcement with us. Welcome, Jeff. Woo! Hello, good evening. Um, I just want to share with you a serving opportunity. On um, November 5th, we're going to have a food packaging party where we're going to, we have purchased food for 36,000 people and that we're going to send to Ukraine. So um, I, have, I have promised 100 volunteers. Okay, so um, November 5th at 10 a.m., and they promised me if we have 100 volunteers, we'll be in and out in two hours. Okay, that's it. November 5th from 10 to 12, um, we're going to have a food packaging event at, in phase one. So um, there are posters. I have some posters here that you can take the screenshots with the QR code. Um, and if you could just sign up and, and just help us serve others, that would be great. We would all appreciate it. And, um, and if you can't come and would like to donate to defray the cost, that would also be great. So November 5th, 10 a.m. All right, thank you. Thanks, Chef. All right, folks, you're, you're, all, getting, you're all getting farther away from me every week, and I'm, I'm feeling sad and lonely, so I'll, I might need extra intercession tonight. But why don't we stand together? Noah's going to lead us in some worship. And, uh, hey, I need to give a shout-out to Noah because he was, he was so excited a few weeks ago when we were talking about Jesus being the serpent crusher that he went out and got himself a sweatshirt that says, I worship the serpent crusher. And on the back it says Yeshua. Can you give us the back for a second? There you go. All right, Noah's going to lead us in some worship together.
I've tasted and I've seen And I'm never going back No, I'm never going back And all I really want is All I really need is You All Lord, come on, lift your hands to him and just, just say that to him. Just say, come meet me here, Lord. Come meet us here, Lord God. Jesus, we need your presence, Lord. We need your presence, Lord. We need you, Jesus, more than we need all of the things that we think we need, all of the things that we tell each other that we need. We need you, Jesus, more than that, Lord God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. Jesus, you are the living bread. You are the living bread that came down from heaven, and we want to feed upon you always, Lord Jesus.
Feed your people tonight, Lord. Feed your people tonight, Lord, with your presence. Lord, we pray you're refreshing and your grace on each one here. Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit would come right now, descend not just on this place, but descend all over this building, Lord, all the ministry, Lord, that's taking place, Lord, to adults, to our teenagers, Lord, to our precious children. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, do new things. Do powerful things, Lord. Do transformative things through your power, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your goodness, Lord. Lord, it's touching some people right now. If you if you have a problem tonight with your throat, just that area, your, your chest, the top of your chest and your throat, just, just lay your hand on that area. I believe the Lord wants to touch you. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, Lord, let your power come. Let your kingdom come upon these ones right now. We say, be made well in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God. Be healed. Voices, come back and be strong. Breathing, come back and be strong in the name of Jesus. Freedom of motion, healing. Some people that you were in car accidents or you had falls and you, you injured your neck and your shoulders. Lord's presence is touching you right now. Healing. Jesus, you are the son of righteousness. Risen with healing in your wings, Lord. Thank you for touching your people tonight. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. The Lord is good. Amen. Hallelujah. Hey, let's take a moment and just greet some friends nearby, and then you can find your seat. All right, all right. Well, good to see you, everybody. Good to be together in the Lord's presence. And um, um, one more announcement that neglected to mention. Ladies, don't forget that there is a, a prayer seminar, a woman's workshop for you this Saturday at 9 a.m. that you can still sign up for. If you're not sure how to do that, please check in with Pastor Kim, and she'll help you out. All right, last week we were talking about how the Old Testament shows Jesus' preexistence as well as his deity, his godhood, right, his incarnation, and his virgin birth. And we talked about why those things are necessary for our redemption, for our salvation. And this week, I want to start looking at how the Bible prophesied about the ministry of Jesus, his ministry as Messiah. And I want to begin by talking about prophecies of the Lord's coming, the prophecies concerning his Forerunner, John the Baptist, his forerunner, and the years leading up to Jesus' public ministry, and then um, how Jesus served the Father. So the Word has quite a bit to say on that, and I think you will find it very interesting. Just by way of review, you remember we've spoken one other time about this prophecy of the Lord being born in Bethlehem, and we find that uh, this is uh, number one, if you have your notes, uh, and uh, if anybody's watching this on YouTube, I know a lot of people do watch this on YouTube. We always put the uh, class notes there in the YouTube show notes, so you'll be able to follow with this as well. But in Micah chapter 5, we have this prophecy of his coming, and we want to talk through this. So verse 1 says, Now gather yourself in troops, O daughter of troops. He has laid siege against us. And then it says this interesting thing. They will strike the judge of Israel with a rod on the cheek. And now the Lord is speaking. He says, But you, Bethlehem Ephrata, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. Therefore, it says, He shall give them up until the time that she who is in labor has 
given birth. That's an interesting passage. I wish we had time to talk about that tonight, but maybe we will at a later date. And then the remnant of his brethren shall return to the children of Israel. And now we have this uh, passage that speaks of this coming one. Verse 4, it says, He shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of of the Lord his God. Those capital letters are indicating again that it's the divine name there, Yahweh. And they shall abide, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. And this one shall be peace. Isn't that interesting? A man who would himself be peace. I like that. When the Assyrian comes into our land, when he treads in our palaces, then we will raise against him seven shepherds and eight princely men. They shall lay waste with the sword the land of Assyria and the land of Nimrod at its entrances. Thus he shall deliver us from the Assyrian when he comes into our land and when he treads within our borders. So a fascinating prophecy of the coming king. And this is a good example, and you will see this on many occasions uh, in the Old Testament. This is a good example of what we call a near and far prophecy. So this is a prophecy that begins in the past, and what's in here might have already been fulfilled, at least partially. But yet there are things in this word that will be more completely fulfilled in the future. Do you see that? This is part of the confusion that people had at the first coming of Jesus because they said, well, wait a minute. He didn't do this and he didn't do that. But some of these passages take in a scope of history sometimes. A prophetic word in the scriptures can cover centuries or in this case can even cover millennia. So has Israel ever completely, has Israel ever laid waste to the land of Assyria? No. <laughs> that, has, that has never happened in history. In fact, usually Israel was at the mercy of the people of Assyria. But this is a reference, this is a prophecy that goes and speaks all the way of the end of the age. And that part of this prophecy is still for the future. But as we've spoken about a couple weeks ago, we've seen before this coming one who is going to be born in Bethlehem, God says here that this person has existed from everlasting. So you have a person who would be born and he's a human being and he's more than a human being because Yahweh himself says that this person is from everlasting. Literally in Hebrew, it means that he is from the days of eternity. Isn't that amazing? So at Christmas time, um, when you hear this passage, when you hear it said about Jesus being born in Bethlehem as the prophet predicted, now you can impress your friends at cocktail parties and you can say, this is a joke, guys, come on. <laughs> work, work with me here. Mo mostly a joke, I hope, or I guess. But you can impress your friends wherever you go and you say, well, you know, actually, the prophecy of Micah 5 is considered to be a fine example of a near and far prophecy. <laughs> so you can tell your friends, you know, it doesn't just have application to Christmas. It goes all the way to the end of the age and the Messiah's end time victory over the Antichrist. Good conversation starter, amen? <laughs> but it's important to show people that that one, that Messiah, God says, not my opinion, it is God who says that his origins are from the days of eternity, that he preexisted. All right, number two, there's this famous word, out of Egypt I called my son. So um, the more you dig into the Old Testament scriptures, the more you will see that there are many, many parallels between the salvation of Christ and how God brought his people out of Egypt 
under Moses. And here, the Holy Spirit says that Messiah himself would come out of Egypt. He says, when Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. Now that has a literal application to Israel, of course. But we know that it was also fulfilled literally in the life of Jesus. And of course, we read about that at Christmas time as well. Now, number three is one that people don't think about <clears throat> quite so much in our day. But at the time of Jesus, it was very much discussed. And this is the word that he shall be called a Nazarene. So very interestingly, in uh, the Gospel of Matthew, it talks about Jesus uh, and you know, his family settling in the village of Nazareth and saying that this was according to what the prophets had said, that he shall be called a Nazarene. And many people will say, well, what does that mean? Why does it say that in the Gospels? Because I've never seen any such prophecy in the Old Testament that says that he would be born a Nazarene. So this is a prophecy that puzzles many people. Now there are a couple of theories, one of which is doesn't really pan out, but one of which is the actual explanation. So one theory is that this is a reference to being a Nazarite, like Samson. Do you know what a Nazarite was? A Nazarite was a person who took this special vow of consecration to God. So you let your hair grow long, and you didn't eat certain foods, you, you, you couldn't touch anything that was dead, and so forth. And this was, for example, seen in the story of Samson, right? And uh, as long as he kept his consecration to God and didn't cut his hair, um, he had his strength and God used him. Had nothing to do with the length of his hair, right? If so, I'd be in big trouble. But it had to do with his consecration to God. And the hair symbolized that. So once he treated his con consecration lightly, right, then the Lord lifted off him. So the Lord's anointing for that purpose. Um, John the Baptist uh, apparently lived that way as well. But we have no evidence of Jesus living this way. Quite the contrary, right? Wasn't Jesus accused by his detractors of eating and drinking like a regular person ate and drank and so forth? So more likely what's actually happening here is that this is a clue from the Holy Spirit. This is a play on words in the Hebrew, and it is designed to point to Jesus being called the branch. So in the Old Testament, the branch was a title of the Messiah, and here's why. We see it in a famous messianic prophecy, Isaiah chapter 11. Many of you know this passage when we were in our Life in the Spirit class, we actually talked about this passage quite a bit in reference to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. But it says, There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. So what does that mean? This is a reference to David's kingdom coming out of the family of Jesse, and the tree is cut down, right? Because the, the line of the kings was was terminated and because Israel was scattered and so forth. But the prophet sees that that's not the end of Israel's hope, that even though the hope uh, may seem that it's gone and the tree has been cut down, as Isaiah looks, he can see that something is growing out of that stump. There is a branch that is growing out. And then he tells us about this person who represents a, a new era of the line of, of kings that comes from King David. Does that, does that make sense, everybody? Hopefully you had at least some protein today, right? So verse 2 says, The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Now this is not a reference to David because Isaiah, you know, is writing about 300 years or 250 years after the time of David. And in fact, as Isaiah is writing this, he sees uh, prophetically the house of David being cut off. And yet there's hope because someday this branch will grow out of it and there will be a restoration of the kingship. And so the branch was a title for Messiah. So let me explain the connection. What's the connection between this branch 
and being called a Nazarene. All right. So the Hebrew word for branch there is netzer. Now I give you this in your notes? I'm pretty sure I did. So it's made up of three letters in Hebrew. Uh, most Hebrew words come out of a... Um, they, they are built around a, a block of three consonants together, typically. So you've got three consonants here that make up this word. There's a nun, a tzadi, and a resh. So Hebrew has its own letter for the tz sound, like a ts or a tz sound. That's, they've got a letter that makes up that sound. So if we were writing this in English, we're going to write it as the sounds as n, tz, r. So when you read that, you say it's netzer, and that means a branch. But that word is written the same way as the word notzri, someone from Nazareth, a Nazarene. And the reason why that's extra important is because when you wrote Hebrew, and even to this day, um, when you're writing formally, Hebrew is usually written with no vowels, just consonants. Usually vowels are only written um, in Hebrew, even today, uh, for foreigners and children who are learning to read. So if we're going through the scripture, uh, in the reading the Old Testament in Hebrew, you have no vowels. You have to supply the vowels yourself. So if you write these two words, in other words, uh, Jesus of Nazareth, he is in Hebrew, he is Yeshua HaNotzri. Jesus the Notzri, the Nazarene. So if I'm writing this in Hebrew, it looks the same. Whether I'm writing branch or Nazarene. So, clue, clue, clue. So every time I'm seeing Jesus the Nazarene, my brain would want to say, if I'm a Hebrew reader, my brain would want to say, Jesus, he's the branch. Yeshua HaNetzer, he's the branch, he's the branch. And this explains one of the reasons, guys, why the people, um, the leaders were, were so angry at Pilate when he wrote what he wrote above Jesus cross in three languages, Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, right? It's bad enough if you were reading that in Latin, they were offended by that. Oh, but in Hebrew, when you wrote that, when they looked at that, Jesus over his head, it says, this is Jesus, the branch, the king of the Jews. Powerful, powerful. So, all right. Number four, there's a prophecy of a great light, and this prophecy tells us where Jesus was going to minister. So in Matthew chapter 4, it says in verse 12, when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the regions of Zebulon and Naphtali. Those are two of the tribes, so you remember... Maybe some of you don't know, but when the land of Israel was, was taken by the Israelites, they had different sections of the land were parceled out to the tribes. And so where this was happening was in the land of Zebulun and Naphtali. And Matthew tells you, he said that this was done so that it might be fulfilled what was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, listen, the people who sat in darkness... Now, that's the people living there, and it was true. By this time, by the time of Jesus, they were living mixed in among the Gentiles. All the big cities in that region were Gentile regions, even though they were in the land of Judea. So Isaiah says, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And upon those who sat in the region in the shadow of death, light has dawned. So it's fascinating to me that Jesus did not minister in Jerusalem he didn't minister in one of the other big cities of Israel. He ministered in obscurity, in small places, and where the Gentiles were in this exact region that Isaiah had spoken of. He lived and ministered in obscurity. And that was, if you recall the Gospels, that was actually offensive to many. You remember that line? Can any good thing 
come out of Nazareth? Okay, how about this line from the Gospels? Ah, search and see. No prophet arises out of Galilee. Interesting, right? His brothers are like, hey, if you're doing all these things, why, why don't you get out of here and go down and do them out openly where people can see you? But no, that's where he ministered in the first part of his ministry, just as the word of God had prophesied. So we also see now as it gets time for Jesus' ministry to be launched, that there are great expectations concerning the Messiah and some other figures, some other people who were expected to minister around the Messiah or close in time to Messiah. And there are several of these people. So the Jewish people were not just waiting for the Messiah, but they were waiting and they actually are still waiting for some other figures to arrive. And so there's this great excitement at the time of Jesus. We've talked about this, that at the time of Christ, there were high expectations that the Messiah was going to appear. And that was due to a number of factors. Anybody remember some of what those factors were? I'm playing school teacher tonight. Who can tell me? Who can tell me why they were so excited and expecting him to come? Anyone? Class? Bueller? Anyone? Okay, number one was Daniel's prophecy of the 70 weeks. They might have argued about the details, just like people still do today, but they knew that they were almost there. It was almost the time for Messiah to come. And the other reason was the visit of the wise men to King Herod a few decades earlier, right? Where is the one who has been born the king of the Jews, right? And the Gospels tell us that when everybody in Jerusalem heard that and put the city in an uproar. So... Um, remember the old movie Ben-Hur with Charlton Heston, right? There's that scene when Ben-Hur comes back to Israel and, and he runs into the wise man who's very old by now and the wise man says, he would be about your age, you know? And that was true because about 30 years had gone by and so there was expectancy. People remembered that these kings came from the east looking for the newborn king of the Jews and Herod had slaughtered the innocence. And so there was this great expectancy. So now you have John the Baptist starts drawing crowds in the wilderness. He starts ministering in the wilderness around the year AD 28. And we read that this delegation from Jerusalem gets sent out to ask him who he was. So in the Gospel of John, Chapter 1, verse 19, it says, This is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. I love the humility of John. He doesn't even wait to be asked, Are you the Messiah? He says, No, no, no. I, no way am I the Messiah. So let's just take that off the table right now. So before they even give him the third degree, right? He's like, First of all, guys, before we continue our conversation, I am not the Mashiach. And then they asked him, so what are you then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? And he said, no. Then they said to him, well, who are you? So that we can give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And he references himself by quoting Isaiah, and we'll look at this in a minute. He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord as the prophet Isaiah said. So uh, to help us get an understanding of what was happening there, of what was the beginning of Jesus' ministry and what was happening in the minds of the people, we need to ask a few questions. So first, who is Elijah to come? Now, I've seen that, uh, I've seen people say that as many as, as perhaps a million people out of a population of, of three or four million were baptized under the ministry of John and his disciples. That's a pretty good revival, amen? So in our terms, that would be like 100 million people coming to Jesus in the United States and getting baptized. And that means that the impact, obviously, of his repentance preaching had uh, 
cause quite a stir. And that's why the leaders send this delegation to ask him. So he asks, you know, he's not the Messiah. He's, he is then asked if he is Elijah, meaning the prophet Elijah, who had been taken up into heaven. Now, Elijah, if you don't know, is a very, very important person in Jewish tradition. And they have, um, not too strong a word perhaps, but they have concocted uh, just an enormous amount of legends about Elijah, just as they have for Moses and some others. Many stories and traditions about him. Many Jewish people believe that Elijah is returning and that he is going to return during some future Passover season. And the reason why people believe that is because God had prophesied uh, through the prophet Malachi, the very end of the, New, of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 4. These are the very last words of the Old Testament, actually. So, you know, God was the one. It wasn't Hollywood. It was God who invented the cliffhanger, right? God ends the Old Testament by saying, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. The end. <laughs> Then, then we have to wait 400 years to find out what happened. So they're hanging there in this expectancy all that time. All right, so people have long argued about what this means. And Jesus said that Elijah would indeed come, but he also said Elijah has come if you're willing to receive it. And that is a reference to John the Baptist. Now, Clearly, John the Baptist is not literally Elijah. He is not the Elijah who was taken up into heaven. Why? Because John the Baptist was born as a baby, right? Remember that. Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, the angel told Zechariah that John, his son, would come in the spirit and power of of Elijah. So he would come with his anointing and with his power, not his miracle working power, because John the Baptist never did any miracles, but he would come with that same anointing to preach repentance that Elijah had in order to cause people to return to Yahweh. Do you remember the most famous story, right, in Elijah's ministry is the fire coming down from heaven. And so um, when the people saw that, they said, Yahweh, he is God. Yahweh is God. So Elijah's ministry caused people to return to the faith of Israel. And John the Baptist did the same. He came in the anointing and the power of Elijah. So now people still debate whether Elijah is returning before the day of the Lord at the end of the age. Many people would say that this word about Elijah, that it is a near and far prophecy, and that Elijah is one of the two witnesses that the Bible speaks of who come and oppose the Antichrist during the 70th week of Daniel that we talked about according to Revelation chapter 11. So that is a very old view in the church. It goes all the way back to the beginning. So here's why people think that. So in the book of Hebrews, uh, Hebrews chapter 9, it tells us that it is appointed to men to die once, right? And then the judgment. So how many of you know that there is no reincarnation? This is, this is you know, my Spanish friends, this is not ida y vuelta, all right? You're just, it's a one-way ticket, and you get there, and you're done. You don't get to go back. There's no do-overs. There's no lifelines, you know, right? This is it. When you leave this planet, your destiny is fixed. No reincarnation. There's no purgatory. None of those things. Those are the traditions of men. But of all the people we know of, only Elijah and Enoch, further back in Genesis, only Elijah and Enoch seem to have not undergone physical death. They are the only two people we know of in the Old Testament who left this world without undergoing physical death. 
And so people have concluded that they still have that appointment waiting for them. We should also point out that although the, the first coming of Christ can be seen as a partial fulfillment of the day of the Lord. It was not the complete fulfillment of that day. The final day of the Lord, the end time day of the Lord, return, ends with the return of Christ and the Lord being magnified over all. So for those reasons, in, in my opinion, if we have to pick some people and say, okay, who are those two witnesses? Uh, in, in my opinion, the real Elijah is actually indeed returning to the earth before Jesus returns. Perhaps at a Passover season, we can't say for sure. Three and a half years before the physical return of Christ. So like I said, that belief in the return of Enoch and Elijah to be those two witnesses, that goes all the way back to the early church. I, I could show you quotes from when Christians first started writing commentaries. So the church father Hippolytus of Rome writing in 200 AD. Um, he talked about Enoch and Elijah coming back. He believed that the 70th week was still future and all of these things that we've been talking about. And, you know, like I said, that was a long time ago. So, so this, this is why, with all of that as a backdrop, this is why it's a big question. When you see this move, when you see hundreds of thousands of people coming to faith and you believe that you're right in the time frame that Messiah could show up at any time, it's natural and normal to make this inquiry. Say, are you perhaps, are you Elijah? Tell us who you are. But John was also asked whether he was someone called the prophet. And he denies that. So who is the prophet? So this person known as the prophet's an interesting figure in the scripture, but in reality, this was another scriptural reference to Jesus that the people simply did not understand. So I want to look at it for a second and get some understanding of this person. It comes from the lips of Moses, and you can find it in Deuteronomy 18. So you say, well, you know, why are we, why are we digging into this? And, and I say, well, why not? When I read the gospel... I want to understand what's in the Gospels. If I see um, them asking John, are you the prophet? I want to know what that means because I want to know God's word and I want to have an understanding of, of Jesus and who he is and what he came to do. So Deuteronomy 18, God is speaking through Moses here and he says, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me. So notice that, Moses saying, a prophet like me. So it's going to be somebody on Moses' level, and as we'll see, even beyond. From your midst, from your brethren, him you shall hear according to all you desire to the Lord your God in Horeb on the day of the assembly, saying, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, nor let me see this great fire anymore, lest I die. So Moses is saying, this prophet's coming so that, you don't have to deal with God coming down here personally in fire <laughs> and consume you. And the Lord said to me, what they have spoken is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. Listen, and it shall be that whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. So God is very serious on this matter. And so from the time of Moses, so we're talking way back, 14, almost 15 centuries, the Jewish people were waiting for this special prophet who was like Moses. These people have speculated about who this is, but it's clearly a very special and very unique person who would have, an, I think in a unique way, would have the word of God inside him. And notice the danger of not following that person. Whoever doesn't follow that prophet would be punished. Now, interesting, you need to know, Muslims say that this was a prediction about Muhammad in the Bible. They say, aha, see, your Bible predicts Muhammad. And that's ridiculous for a number of, of reasons. First of all, the prophet whom Moses speaks of here is, he says a couple of times, is to be one of their own brethren. In other words, this prophet is a Jew, an Israelite. 
at least, if not a Jew, uh, if not from the tribe of Judah, he's at least an Israelite. He is not an Arab or any of those other nationalities in the Middle East. It also says that he would have the word of God within his mouth, within him. Now, even Muhammad did not claim to have the word of God within him, but he claimed that God's word was dictated to him by an angel. And in fact, Muhammad did not even want that revelation, but he originally thought that it was something satanic. So that hardly qualifies as having the word of God within you. This prophet would have the word of God within him. It is not a reference to Muhammad. It is a reference to Jesus Christ. Should have got one amen on that. But. Okay. Number six. Let's talk about John, the true forerunner, and the servant of Yahweh. So you might have heard me in the past refer to the book of Isaiah uh, kind of a joking way as the, as the gospel of Isaiah. And one of the reasons why people do that is because Isaiah... As you read Isaiah, especially the latter half of Isaiah, Isaiah had this revelation of Christ that was far more extensive and far superior, apparently, to what the other prophets enjoyed. He had astounding revelation of the coming one. And the book of Isaiah certainly does deal with Isaiah's own time and Isaiah's own situation, but it also has these lengthy stretches of visions concerning this person who's known as the servant of the Lord, the servant of Yahweh. So Isaiah has 66 chapters, and beginning with chapter 40, it is almost continual prophecy all the way to the end of the book. A lot of that prophecy came in the form of prophetic songs. Perhaps most of it came that way. And these chapters speak of topics like the forerunner of Messiah, whom we know as John the Baptist. They talk about Messiah coming into the world, his characteristics, his mission and his suffering and his glorification. Isaiah also speaks about the spread of the gospel among the nations, meaning the Gentile nations, non-Jews. And he talks about the future glory of of the reign of Christ upon the earth. So much, much a good, I, I don't know that anybody's done the calculations, but probably half or two-thirds of what we know about the age to come in reference to Messiah's reign on the earth comes from Isaiah. So it's really important. If we want to study how the scriptures point to Jesus as God's servant and as the Messiah, we need to take some time to examine these passages examine these songs of the servant of Yahweh, beginning at Isaiah 40. We'll talk first about the forerunner of the Messiah, and then we'll look at the passages that speak about the Messiah. And in many of these passages, you're going to see that it is the servant himself who is speaking. So in some cases, you're going to see that it's clear that God the Father is speaking about his servant in many cases, though, it is the servant who is speaking about himself, speaking about his mission and what he's going to accomplish. So in the beginning of these songs now, in Isaiah 40, is where the Spirit of the Lord impels the forerunner. He pushes the forerunner out there to proclaim the coming of Yahweh. So in verse 1, and if you're a fan of Handel's Messiah, you know these lines. So he says, comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Then in verse 3, the famous lines, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. That's the divine name. He doesn't say, notice, he doesn't say prepare the way for God's special servant. He says prepare the way for Yahweh. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough places smooth. That's not a reference, by the way, to geography, although it can be. That is a reference to people. If you are a valley... If you're low, if you're humble, you'll be exalted. But if you think that you're a mountain in God's face, 
you will be brought low. Verse 5, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The voice said, cry out. And he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. O Zion, you who bring good tidings, get up into the high mountain. O Jerusalem, you who bring good tidings, lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up, be not afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. And then verse 10, this prediction of the Lord's servant. Behold, the Lord God shall come with a strong hand and his arm shall rule for him. Now you will see often in the Old Testament as you go through it, you will notice that God speaks of his servant, of the one who executes his will as his arm or his right arm, because that was a symbol for uh, a person's power, a person's ability, right? Their capacity to do something. So God will come and his arm shall rule for him. And that is a reference also to the Messiah, do you remember later on, we'll see it when it speaks of the Messiah's sufferings in Isaiah 52 and 3. It says, who has believed our report and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? So it's clear that the arm of the Lord is a person. It says, behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. So when he comes, he's rewarding people. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. So there's a reference again that he has a flock of people. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are young, talking about his sheep, so who are with young. Now, um, I want you to notice, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something that you might not have ever heard this before. People commonly hear these scriptures at Christmas time and so forth. It's Handel's Messiah lifts very heavily from this passage, and you've heard this song. Maybe you've sung it yourself. Most of what's in that very famous passage has nothing to do with the first coming of Christ, but with the second coming of Christ. Read through it again when you go home, and you will see that this is one of the, the best, although we don't think of it like this way, uh, this way, this is one of the best examples of a near and far prophecy. John the Baptist certainly applied it to himself, right, to his own time and to his own ministry, but there is a definite end times application to this at the return of Jesus. But John very consciously, of course, applied it to himself. And he pointed people to Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He, hit through his preaching, he prepared the people for Jesus' ministry. He prepared the way of the Lord in people's hearts. Now, this is what that means when it says prepare the way of the Lord. In a spiritual sense, he was preparing the way for the king to come to your heart. In the ancient world, if the king was going to come to your city, they would have said, prepare the way for the king. And then they would go out and clean the road, secure the road, push all the boulders and obstacles off the road so that the king could have a fast and direct route to your city. That's what that means. So when John the Baptist says, you know, what are you? You know, I, I'm the voice of someone who is crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill made low. What does that mean? It means Jesus wants to come to you. He wants to reveal himself in his glory, saying, say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Here he is. And he wants to travel to your heart. So in order that Jesus might come to you quickly and in an unobstructed way, we have to do that. We have to prepare the way of the Lord so that Jesus can travel to me. There's no hindrance on the road to my heart. And I'm low. I'm not high that my mountain has to be brought down. 
And so this is how John conceived of his mission. This is what I'm doing. I am making the way of the Lord straight for people. So now um, section seven in your notes, Jesus is the special servant of Yahweh. And Isaiah, there are at least four of what we call the servant songs in which this special servant of Yahweh brings the victory of God to God's people. Powerful. That's what the servant's mission is to bring the victory of God to God's people. But the way that he does it is probably not how human beings would think to do it. Mostly, it is through the suffering that the servant experiences at God's command. That's a mouthful, isn't it? So the way that the servant brings us the victory of Yahweh is through the suffering, through what he experiences, so that we can know God. And he does that at God's command. So I've given you the references as to where those songs can be found in Isaiah 42, 49, 50. And then perhaps the most famous one begins at the end of Isaiah 52 and goes on into 53. And by examining these songs, we can see, and you will see that Yeshua, Jesus, has fulfilled these songs. And he is that servant of Yahweh. The New Testament writers often refer to Jesus as the servant. Now, if you're used to reading the old King James, if you've got some gray in your hair, as, as I do, um, then you might be used to, in some passages, seeing Jesus referred to as the, the child of God, and he is the son of God. But some of those passages, it's actually poorly translated because the writers were saying he's the servant of God. In Acts chapter 3, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant, Jesus. That's actually how it reads in the Greek. The Greek word there is the word that means servant or handmaid. So unfortunately for us, some of our English Bibles have picked that up as child. We pray that, you know, Acts chapter 4, grant that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy child, Jesus. But it doesn't say that in the Greek. They preached. Here's, here's the point, and here's why I'm taking time to explain this to you. When the apostles were preaching the gospel, they used that language to show people that Jesus is that person that Isaiah kept talking about. Jesus is the one, the servant of Yahweh, who sang prophetically through Isaiah and those songs and told you what he was going to do when he came. So, he is that servant. So, uh, number eight, and we'll look at some of them and we'll, we'll close it out. I don't, I don't want to speak as long as I did uh, last week, but uh, Isaiah 42, look at my servant. So verse one says, behold, my servant whom I uphold. So this is the father talking. My elect one, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice or righteousness to who? To the Gentiles. Right away, notice that there is an immediate connection to the Gentile world, that he's going to bring them judgment or justice. And this is true. Christ brought us the freedom that comes through the law of God. I don't mean the law of Moses. I mean the knowledge of God. The Jewish concepts of God and man came to us through Christ, and it became Judeo-Christian civilization, which we are very busily tearing down at the moment. Right, But he will bring that forth to the Gentiles. So immediately there's a connection of the word of God and the salvation of God going to the whole world. But Christ is the chosen one here and God's delighting in him and his spirit's upon him. Verse 2, he will not cry out nor raise his voice nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and smoking flax he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. So we know right from the Gospels that Jesus was not a troublemaker in the sense of being political, a political radical. He is the Prince of Peace. And in verse 3, it speaks of his gentleness in dealing with people, especially those who were hurting, those who were bound. 
Verse 4, I love this. He will not fail nor be discouraged until he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands shall wait for his law. This is, I'm positive that this is a near and far prophecy as well because we already see his word, his gospel, his law on the earth, but a day is coming when all the nations will wait for it and not rebel against his word. So in the Old Testament, in Hebrew, that word coastlands, or sometimes your Bibles will say isles, that is a synonym for the far off Gentile nations. So in the Jewish mind, and that goes way back, but in the Jewish mind, that was how they thought of the far off Gentile nations beyond the sea. So it's us. And it speaks about the universality of Christ's kingdom, that it would take in all the earth. So you can see whether, whether people believed it or not, at the time of Jesus, all right, get, get this, this is important. Whether people understood it well at Jesus' time, it was always prophesied that the gospel, the word of Messiah, was going to go to the whole earth and sweep in all the Gentiles. I mean, all you have to do is look around uh, this room. Where, where's, all my, where's all my painters in the room? Huh? We got every Pantone shade and color in this room. This, this word was fulfilled, amen? amen? Verse five, thus says God the Lord who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread forth the earth and that which comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk on it. So now God, through Isaiah, this, this blows your mind. Sometimes you gotta look at it and you say, whoa, this is the Father speaking to Jesus. So you're getting sometimes windows here into the conversations within the Trinity. How awesome is that? And look what he says in verse 6. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles. So God says he will sustain his special servant. And notice this odd language, that the servant himself will be the covenant. What is the new covenant? It's not following the rules of the laws of Moses. It's that we are in Christ. We are in the servant. The new covenant doesn't even depend on my obedience, but it depends on the obedience of Christ. And God says that he will be a light to the Gentiles. Now, sometimes uh, Jewish people, they want to push back against that. Say, well, no, that's not referring to the Messiah. It's referring to Israel. It's referring to, um, it's referring to you know, the people of Israel and so forth. But if you read these references, you see that they are references spoken to an individual. When God says, I'm going to give you as a covenant to the people, how can he give the people as a covenant to the people? Right? It doesn't make sense like that. Section 9, that this goes to the ends of the earth. So Isaiah 49, God says, and this is actually the servant speaking now. Listen, O coastlands, to me, and take heed, you peoples, from afar. The Lord has called me from the womb, from the matrix or the womb of my mother. He has made mention of my name. Does that ring a bell? Mary was newly pregnant, 10 minutes or thereabouts, when the angel said, right, you shall call his name Jesus. And he has made my mouth like a sharp sword. Doesn't the Bible speak of the word of God coming out of Jesus' mouth like a sharp sword to judge? In the shadow of his hand, he has hidden me and made me a polished shaft in his quiver, he has hidden me. Now, if you don't know, that's a reference. He's comparing himself to an arrow, the shaft of an arrow, an arrow that is hidden in the quiver. That's the thing that they wear on their back that holds the arrows. And he said to me, you are my servant, O Israel, which is prince of God, in whom I will be glorified. So he, the servant here is speaking to the far off Gentile nations. Notice that the servant and his identity are hidden and not revealed until it's time for him to be revealed. He's in God's hand, and he's in God's quiver. 
right? He, God was like, oh, I, I got something for you, devil. <laughs> Not telling you what it is, but oh, wait till you see it. It's a killer. <laughs> Verse four, notice the servant having to trust God. Now, just imagine, this is prophetically speaking, this is Jesus speaking through Isaiah. Then I said, I have labored in vain. I've spent spent my strength for nothing and in vain. Yet surely my just reward is with the Lord and my work with God. And now the Lord says, who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him. Now, now notice, see, by saying things like that, we can tell our Jewish friends, the servant is not Israel. Because otherwise that makes no literal sense. He says that he formed me from the womb to be his servant to bring Jacob back to him so that Israel is gathered to him. For I shall be glorious in the eyes of the Lord and God will be my strength. So the servant had that moment of discouragement that all of his efforts have been for nothing and yet he still trusted in God to bring all of his efforts to a successful outcome so he would be glorious no matter what happens. What a picture that is of Jesus and even his own internal emotions, right? And so now God speaks back to the servant. Verse 6, indeed he says. So this is the father speaking now to the servant. It is too small a thing. In other words, too small a, re a reward is the sense. It is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles, so that you, not your words, not your thoughts, your laws, your teachings, so that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. It's too small a reward for Jesus for what he did, that he should only just be the deliverer of Israel. And again, the language indicates that he can't possibly be Israel itself, or it would make no literal sense. And I'll, I'll close with this next section because we wouldn't have time to get into Isaiah 53, but this last part here in, in Isaiah 50 leads into it because you begin to see the sufferings of the servant, the sufferings of Messiah, how he willingly, at the Father's command, gave himself over to this for our salvation. Verse 4, The Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear as the learned. Beautiful. So you see there the, the intimacy of the relationship that the servant has with the father and how Jesus was such a master of the word, how the Holy Spirit instructed him, right? Verse five, the Lord God has opened my ear and I was not rebellious, nor did I turn away. So opening the ear was, was symbolic for, um, meant becoming the willing bond servant of somebody else. That you, you completely gave yourself over to that person. Because when you were the servant of somebody and they let you go free, you might have decided, no, I don't want to go free. I want to stay in this family of my master forever. And they had this ceremony where they would take you out to a post and they would put a hole through, through your ear and it became a mark that you were a servant forever. And so this is the meaning of his words there. The Lord has opened my ear. I was not rebellious. So complete, total obedience to the Father. Verse six, I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting, which is such a normal human reflex, right, to do, but he embraced it. Remarkable description of how people mocked Jesus. Verse seven, for the Lord God will help me, therefore I will not be disgraced, therefore I have set my face like a flint. So a flint was really, was the hardest stone that they had, right, that they used for sharpening and for like metal work and jewelry and things like that. And I know that I will not be ashamed. He is near who justifies me, who will contend with me. Let us stand together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near me. Surely the Lord God will help me. Who is he who will condemn me? Indeed, they will all grow old like a garment. 
the moth will eat them up. So that's Jesus' confidence. As he's on the cross, you can imagine Jesus, I bet he was, he had these words of Isaiah in his mind, helping him to trust in the Father as he went through that. Who among you fears the Lord? Who obeys the voice of his servant? So notice Jesus is saying, you fear the Lord, but you also have to obey the voice of his servant. Who walks in darkness and has no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord and rely upon his God. Look, all you who kindle a fire, who encircle yourselves with sparks, walk in the light of your fire and in the sparks you've kindled. This you shall have from my hand. You shall lie down in torment. So that's kind of a, a, an obscure passage, but he's talking about people who trust in their own righteousness. So this idea of you lighting your own fire, like I don't want God's truth. I'm going to light my own fire. So the servant is saying, okay, if that's what you want. Go ahead, enjoy your little sparks <laughs> that you're making. But what you need to do instead is trust in God, he's saying, and obey the voice of God's servant. And those who trust in their own righteousness, those who kindle their own fire, like he's talking about there, they are going to be disappointed and they're going to be ruined. So that's a, that's a lead in to Jesus' sufferings on the cross uh, and next week, we will look at the marvelous prophecies of the crucifixion, which begins at um, Isaiah 52, takes us through Isaiah 53. And we will also look at the 22nd Psalm, which is also a messianic psalm that prophesies um, concerning the, um, the crucifixion of Christ. Very powerful. And in fact, quoted by Jesus uh, on the cross. So if you want to do a little homework before next week, make sure that you just read Isaiah 53 and actually read Isaiah 50, the end of 52, 53, and read Psalm 22. And that will kind of just kind of frame your mind for, for that teaching and that discussion. So, okay, so it, it is 20 after. So we have about 10 minutes before anybody might need to go pick up their, their kittles, but uh, we'll take We'll take questions. Okay, so last week we were here till midnight. Now we have no questions. So, so Miss Allison. Just a reference to when you said the, the arm of the Lord. Not the one written here, the one you said. The reference to the arm of the Lord. Okay, so the, the well, there are many places where it mentions the arm of the Lord, but I was thinking particularly of the beginning of... Um, Isaiah 53, where it says, who has believed our report? And it's God in the Holy Spirit speaking, actually. And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And then it, the rest of that chapter is actually talking about the arm of the Lord before he, you know, he grew up before him like a tender shoot and so forth. So that whole discussion in Isaiah 53 is about the arm of the Lord. So it's not just a vague reference to God's strength. It is a person. You know, you. so I thought I saw a hand over here somewhere. Right. Justice is here too on the prowl. So, Miss Polly. So during the uh, Passover Seder, um, they set an empty uh, seat for Elijah, and so you know they're waiting for Elijah to come. So is this? lining up with what you were saying about Elijah coming before uh, Messiah? Yeah, good, good question. Thank you. So absolutely, that is absolutely the case. So um, it's in the Word, and it's also in their own tradition. So um, how many of you went to Seder's growing up? Okay, so a few of you did. And uh, there is a point in many satyrs, the way that many people do it, where um, there is a point where it's usually the youngest child will get up uh, and go to the door, open the door, and uh, see if Elijah, uh, the prophet, is there. And um, there's a t there is a place at the table, or at least a cup, that is set for him. And, um, you know, I like to say that uh, one day, one year, probably in Jerusalem, itself, although not necessarily, but some little kid is going to have the shock of his life <laughs> because, you know, uh, Eliyahu is going to be there and so is Hanoch. They're going to be there 
and they're going to say, what? You couldn't put out two plates, you know? And, um, but, uh, but that is the belief that he is the, the forerunner of the Messianic era. So a lot of the things that, um, that we are seeing in our world right now, the wars, the certain configurations of nations that we're seeing. So a lot of our Orthodox Jewish friends would say that these are the footsteps of Messiah. So we are soon to see, as, as they understand it, um, obviously they don't have a New Testament understanding of it, but uh, what we know about it, remember, comes from their scriptures, and they are expecting the, the war of, of Gog and Magog that Ezekiel talked about. They are expecting that war uh, to happen, and they are expecting uh, Elijah to come as, as the forerunner uh, of Messiah. Because he does come before the day of the Lord. So if you um, get your concordance or look up your Bible software, go to blueletterbible.com or whatever you use and do a search for that phrase, the day of the Lord, you will see what the prophet said about it. And so God said very clearly that Elijah will come before the great and terrible day of the Lord. And so they believe, um, at least the ones who believe in the truth of the scriptures, do believe that that is going to happen. So, And the early churches, I mentioned, believe that too. So uh, I have a couple of those quotes from, from uh, Hippolytus, and it's, uh, they're, very, they're very interesting, so maybe I'll throw them into the, into the realm chat and whatever so you, so you can see it's very interesting how he talks about um, the Messiah being slain after the 69 weeks and then you know, then this in the future, the 70th week will come and then Enoch and Elijah will come and so forth. So it's very, it's very interesting to read somebody uh, giving a commentary on Daniel and talking about those things from 200 AD. Very cool. So, yeah, tell me. So just to expound on what you're saying, um, is that a near and far prophecy like John the Baptist was Elijah coming before Jesus yeah, so the question is whether that's a near and far prophecy about Elijah. Uh, I do believe it is. I believe that the references to the day of the Lord, there's a definite near and far that's there. In fact, Peter, on the day of Pentecost, made that reference himself. So Peter said that this outpouring of the Spirit, he tied it to Joel, right? He said this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel, you know, in the last days I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. And that was a reference to the day of the Lord. But there is that ultimate final fulfillment of the day of the Lord, which, which culminates in the physical return of Christ and, and the resurrection from the dead and, and all of those things that, that are yet to come. So, so it's interesting that these things, um, these things are, they're kind of like echoes, Right? So at Jesus' first coming, there was, there was a forerunner, right? And in Jesus' second coming, yes, there are forerunners, but there's also a whole forerunner company of people, which is us. We are the ones who are crying out, who the church, you know, been praying, Lord, your kingdom come, let your will be done, and who are praying, the spirit and the bride say, come, Lord Jesus. So the closer we get to the end of the age, you know, that needs to be our heart's cry. Not to be indifferent as we look at the world conditions, but realize, you know, that education, politics, whatever is not the answer. The only answer for real and permanent justice on this planet is Maranatha, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Only the Prince of Peace will be able to bring real peace to the world. You know, peace the way that human beings, right? Man's peace is like, okay, let's stop killing each other for a bit. That's not peace. That's taking a breather, right? Real peace only comes when the king of righteousness is here. Read Isaiah chapter 2 talking about, you know, he will, he will render decisions between great and mighty nations, and there's no more war and so forth. Why? Because he's there. <laughs> he's there to keep the peace, and the, the nations are hanging off of his every word. And so don't, don't get me going now. We'll, 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 we'll have a chance later on um, as we get closer to Thanksgiving. We'll have a chance to talk about the millennial glory. Yes, Miss Margaret. Um, this is a comment, but when you were talking about at the beginning how the time when Jesus did um, appear on the earth, 
that there was an expectancy because of those couple reasons. So it just seems like there would be more reason why they should have seen who Jesus was because of those reasons, but maybe perhaps because he wasn't what they expected the Messiah to be or whatever. But it just, you said that and it just seems like, I know some received him, but they should have really realized, I mean, that he was the Messiah. Yeah, good comment. But, you know, we, as we always say, uh, it's, it's never about this. It's always about this. We're the same. I could, I could go to people. I could talk to people and say, hey, listen, let me show you in the Bible all these things that have been predicted by the Bible that are coming to pass and that have happened in the last 60, 70 years. And that is really proof, you know, that Jesus is coming like super soon. And, you know, some people are like, wow, that's really interesting. Uh, you know, I have a good friend that um, came to the Lord because I laid that out for him, you know, in college. He got saved. I, I scared him into, <laughs> into being saved. But thank God, you know. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but yet there's other people, and I think most of you know this, you could lay that all out for them. You could show them all the messianic prophecy and you could show them the prophecy that's being fulfilled in our time right now. And they say, well, that's good for you, bro. You do you. Live your truth, man. That's cool. All right, preacher man. Right? So the people don't receive that word, like it says in Hebrews, and the word is not mixed with faith in their hearts. Right? And then, of course, people we know are not naturally disposed to receive and seek God anyway. So it needs that work of the Spirit. Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father what? draws him. So I guess, I guess what I'm saying, Margaret, is number one, I agree with you. But number two, it's like that same dynamic is happening right now. I mean, it always blows my mind. Like when I read the book of Revelation, it's like, okay, they know it's God. They know it's Jesus, and what are they doing? They refuse to repent. Go look it up. There's this, there's this uh, frightening list of six big sins that people refuse to repent of in the last days, and it's, you want to know what they are? Just turn on your TV. Um, they refuse to repent of those things, and they curse and blaspheme God. I mean, can you imagine that it's going to get to a point of, of such revelation, no pun intended, such revelation that people know? I mean, you might have heard me say this before, but read Revelation chapter 6, and when the day of the Lord is coming and the people um, see these things coming to pass, and they know, they know what it is, they know that it's God's wrath, and they know who's sending it. They go and they start digging. They get into their bunker, fall on us, rocks and mountains, and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the Lamb, because the great day of their wrath has come. Dude, <laughs> that's your shot, man. <laughs> Repent. This is it. This is your shot. You, even, you know it's God. It's not like, oh, it's a comet. NASA says a comet's coming. No, these people are out there like, Jesus Christ is doing this. But instead of, why? Again, because it's about, it's about this. It's about what I want. I don't want, I want to do my thing. I want to do my thing. My will, my will be done on earth and not in heaven, right? So. So, hey, since sir. we're on Enoch and Elijah, John... When, when God said, uh, when Jesus told the disciples in the book of John, what is it to you if I leave him alive until I come? And John was supposedly, you know, the beloved of the Lord. And also he died supposedly of an old age. But there's also speculation that he went like Enoch and Elijah and has not, didn't physically die. I didn't go into more investigation, but that's about what I have. Yeah, so I think that uh, it is it is 8.32, by the way. And I think you can tell from looking at the 
the analog clock. I'll never get used to having to say analog clock, but if you look at the big clock, you will notice that the battery on the big clock died. So the digital clock is always accurate, though. So um, don't ask me why it's military time. It's just because justice is smarter than we are. But So I think, I think we can be reasonably certain that Elijah is one of the witnesses, right? So we have a lot more biblical evidence to go on. We have a specific scripture, like I said, at the end of the book of Malachi. As to the other one, I go with Enoch, um, just because we know he hasn't died. Um, and um, you have the two other candidates that people throw out. One is John. Um, John, I think at the end of his gospel, is taking... He's, he's taking pains to say, well, well Jesus didn't say I was going to stay alive till he came, right? John even tries to correct that the rumor or whatever was already going around that he wasn't going to die. And so John even says, Jesus didn't say that he's going to live till I come. He's going to say, what do you care <laughs> if he lives till I come? So, so I don't know. Um, the other candidate that people put up is Moses, and that's because there are, um, you know, like Moses being a representative of the law and uh, Elijah being a representative of the prophets. Plus, Moses, um, the miracles or plagues that Moses executed are similar to the plagues that the two witnesses unleash in Revelation chapter 11. However, um, the Torah does tell us that Moses died and that God buried him. So I'm thinking, you know, Moses died, whatever, 3,500 years ago. Is God going to bring him out of the ground and then have him be killed again? So I don't think, I just don't think Moses is a good candidate. So that's, that's why I go, I go with Enoch, uh, you know, and Elijah. And I think those are pro that's probably where most people land. Not that that makes it right, but I think we're very solid uh, on Elijah, but it's an interesting topic because you know um, we're we're living life in our very in a very ordinary way, but it probably won't be too much longer that things are going to get like rather extraordinary uh, on our little blue marble here that we're spinning on. So um, thank you for that. Yeah, Lee. This is going to be the, uh, might, might, might not be easy for you to answer, but going on the two witnesses, if they have to, or they will return before Jesus' return, and in the midpoint of that, of Daniel's 70 weeks, is a, a, a time frame or a, a, a cutoff, um, before Jesus returns, this has to occur. When Jesus returns, it says that there'll be a cloud of witnesses with him, which you just spoke of being us, the church. When then is the transformation in the twinkling of an eye of the dead in Christ and the living in Christ going to occur if we are coming with him before the whole millennial reign that you mentioned before? Mm -hmm. That's kind of complicated. Yeah, it is kind of complicated. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't know, I, don't know what, I don't know what makes you think that any of these are, answer, are easy to answer, but... <laughs> No, I just like how you said this might be hard to answer. They're all hard to answer. <laughs> but um, what's that? Well, th all right. Thank you. Praise God. But, um, okay, so I, the, church is not, the church is not the great cloud of witnesses. So that's like a different concept. That's, that's addressed to us, you know, that we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. And so we need to run our race with patience, right? Um, so I think, I think the answer that I could give to that would take about a half an hour to lay out. So uh, most people would say that the two witnesses kind of arrive right at that midpoint because they are, their ministry is one of bearing witness, as the name implies, and they are also confronting the Antichrist in his kingdom, and they also have authority from God for those 
three and a half years, which is the, the time during which Antichrist has authority. So in other words, I think most people would say that they are here for the second half of the week, not the first half of the week. So Antichrist does his thing, uh, you know, the two witnesses show up, and they're actually killed right at the end. Um, so, uh, which, which probably tells me that most of their ministry is confined to that Jerusalem area. So, but as, but as far as the timing, we would have to, uh, and um, we may possibly, the beginning of the year, I may go and teach um, the end times courses that I, that I have taught uh, in the past because it's been some years and a lot of people are asking for it. So in order to answer those questions, I would, ha I would have to go through and teach all of the various rapture views. So the question is, at what point relative to that 70th week, right, are we, are, is the church raptured brought up into the presence of Christ. So you have, there are, there are several, I want to say there are three main views at this point. So one view is that that happens at the beginning of the seven years or just before it. Um, one view says that it's at the end of the seven years. Um, another view is that it happens at some point after the midway mark, like right at the sixth seal. Um, there is another view that says that it happens in the middle, but that view has pretty much died out. So your biggest views are the so-called pre-tribulation view, which is at the beginning of the week, the post-tribulation view at the end, and the pre-wrath view, which would happen, we don't know when, but whenever the sixth seal happens. So at some point after the middle then when the wrath of God is beginning, then at that point. Because the issue is, um, no matter what your view is, the issue is that the church is not subject to the wrath of God. That's, that's, a key, that's one of the key principles. So the um, Bible says he reserves wrath for his enemies. Paul tells us that, that God has not appointed us to wrath. So the question is always then, are we completely taken out? Or are we preserved through? Um, you know, are we here for part of it? So those are things that um, to talk about in a deeper way requires like a really deep dive. So when I, when I teach on that, I take, like a whole, I take like a whole hour just to lay out the, those views uh, on the timing. So in the Assemblies of God denomination, they have an official belief that it's what is called pre-tribulation, that it's before the seven years. That is the official belief of the Assemblies of God. Certainly does not mean that everybody who goes to an Assemblies of God church uh, believes that way. Um, probably most, you know, most scholars probably do not believe that way. Most scholars probably believe post-trib. Um, so, I mean, there are as you can imagine, there are enough books that have been written about this to literally fill this room up to the ceiling, but it's just, it's not, you know, it's not something that we're going to, that we're going to hammer out tonight. <laughs> so, so hang in there, and sometime around uh, April or May, we'll give you like a whole two, one or two nights on it, but I will, my intention is in this class, depending on how this, I have a few topics to get through here, I need to spend some time talking about um, what it means that Jesus is the Son of Man because it's a very, very important concept in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And then I am going to take probably the last two, two and a half weeks to talk uh, like an overview of, of end times, and that'll kind of help, you know, lay some groundwork so then when we get into January, I, I, might, I might do the things to come course, which I taught like 10 years ago or so, which is just basically an overview of, of end times, the whole course. So, yeah, so it's, but it's a good, it's a good, I mean, it's, it's a natural question. I don't mind the question. It's a very natural question to raise because, you know, we're talking about the Antichrist and the two witnesses and so forth and uh, Jesus fulfilling his ministry, you know, by coming and destroying the Antichrist and setting up his, setting up his kingdom. So it's a very natural thing to ask, so. <clears throat> yeah. 
Yeah. So if you go to the Assemblies of God website, um, they have position papers there that you can download. So there might be like a PDF, you know, 10 pages or whatever. So you can see what, what their belief is. Um, so anybody else? So make straight the way of the Lord and drive safe. Thank you for being with us. And we'll see you next time. Read Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22. God bless you, friends.